So we have a data set called the StuMap data set, stewardship mapping. That's the fun of it. And so what that data set is, it maps civic stewards in working in New York City as a form of points and polygon data that are spatial data network lines that show how they connect together. And then also attribute data or just flat spreadsheets as well that are the survey responses to these groups. And so we, Lindsay, myself, and John have been working for a while at visualizing these data and also doing research on the data as well, drawing from the data. And so what we did for this hackathon was set it up for four topic areas that folks could choose between. One was to think about how do we keep this survey more current? So what happens is we did the survey in 2007, we did it in 2017. Um, we'll probably do it in 2027, but right now we're at 2022, five years out. And so things are starting to get out of date. Like people have moved on from these organizations, contact information has changed. That was one or one topic idea. The second was how could we advance more ways of visualizing the data in just creative ways, thinking beyond the ways that Lindsay, John, and myself have already been thinking. And then T3 or the, the third topic was to think about so far, we've been visualizing spatial data and network data, but how can we take some of the open-ended responses to the survey and also an associated Twitter data set that some of the groups are on Twitter and think about text analysis. So that leaves us with the final topic, um, which is looking at civic capacity in relationship to climate change. There we have, we're thinking of these stewardship groups as representing civic capacity in different neighborhoods in the city. We've created a preliminary stewardship index and thinking about putting a relationship to things like flooding and heat issues that right are, are arising in the city because of climate change. I'm going to drop a few links in the chat. It might take me a few minutes just to, to put them all together, but that'll give you folks that are joining now just some ways to see the data I'm talking about, how to access the data if you wanted to take a look and do any sort of analyses yourself. So. With the, the kind of background, and then we, what we did was organize our Discord, just some conversations. We met a little bit yesterday to talk about how things were going, and then folks had kind of went on their way. And this is our, our chance to take a look at what folks have come up with. And it's only been, what, like a day and a half? So these are going to be really preliminary, preliminary things, just getting us started. I don't know, Jeff, would you like to start us off? Give us a background on, on kind of the problem you were working on and where the direction you've been going. Yeah, yeah. So, so my background is I'm, I'm a data person. And that's after years of being a software engineer, quotes, it, it all runs, it all ends up being data, right? You're only, you can only go for, uh, forward as far as the data you have. The more structured the data, the better. But when I saw someone had taken tweets and, and, and another person was looking at the tweets, th that seemed to be like live data and, and something that you could really make use of if it was structured a little better. I, I don't know. What was the source of the, uh, of the initial data we had from tweets? Yeah. So we had a, a colleague that looked at all the Twitter handles for groups that responded to the 2017 survey and scraped backwards those data set or like their, what they posted since the beginning of 2019. And I think it stopped in August, 2020. So, so this was, uh, yeah, so here's a list of the tweets. So the screen name is the, uh, is a Twitter handle of the group. And there's about 30 of them that, were, that are included in this set. And if you look over at the uh, timestamps, this is new information from, you know, July of 2020. And of course, can be expanded into, if, if you have an API to grab Twitter, you get this information real, real time, essentially. Uh, yeah, so it was one minute, in case you, you aren't familiar, this is VS Code. It's really becoming the, the editor of choice for, for so many reasons. You can do a lot of remote programming. I'm using Clojure as the language and this uh, plugin called Calv for it, which is really great. Uh, but I'm going to start with the data. So this is the, this is this, a, a tab separated a variable file of the data we have. So basically it's a screen name text, which is the text of the tweet. And at the end, we have the date stamp of the tweet and then the session number was put into it. And this was also uh, in Excel or our Google Sheets we were looking at and that sort of stuff. But, but there's a lot of structured data in these tweets. So that's what this is all. So I made this project called Stu Tweets. And I originally set up to do this database. There's a database called XTB, which is a bi-temporal database where you can put data in and then you can update the data and the actual history of any changes that have happened to the data uh, are, are in place and you can just see the history. So anything that changes, you have a history. Didn't have time to actually put it in this format, but just wanted to mention that. 
So the extractions is what happens here. This is a closure code. In it. And over on the right is a, what they call a rep or a read eval print loop. So I can evaluate each of this, each of these functions over here and the output over to the right. <clears throat> and uh, so there's something called stew tweets. <clears throat> and that is, if you look over to the right, oh, well, I'll just do it from up here. I'll just skip this for you if not top for, to start with. So we're defining a, uh, a variable called stew tweets, and that's going to hold all the tweets. So we're taking the, uh, the file and we're just going to split it by lines. And then we have, also we have the clean survey list. I'll show you that resource. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the survey information that, that put from Excel and this is the clean version. So there's fields in here that are clean. <laughs> so I, so we have both of those pieces of information and there's a lot of functions here cleaning up, but let's just cut to the chase. So we're going to take those tweets. We're going to drop the first one, which is the header column where we're not going to dissociate the tweet text so we can show you how it is in place. We're going to take 24 of them and then we're going to print them out in a nice way. Oh, I have to reevaluate this for some reason. So over on the right, this is each of the tweets, but with the structure and information, you can see, if you see can you see this, that there's a uh, opening bracket and a closing bracket on each of these records that's similar to JSON, right? And you have keys and values. So these are just key value pairs for each record. This is not JSON. This is something called Eden, the extensible data notation, which closure favors. So keys are, keys are key words. Instead of strings, they're, they're key words. So you might see this kind of notation in Ruby for a different purpose. And, and then you have the value next to it. So taking that tweet, the, the tweet text here is what you start with. But we're able to parse out, there's a, there's text for congrats. So this tweet is congratulating this mention. There's a hashtag for age care. Here's the first mention in the group. Here's a website associated with it. It is a grant because we checked to see if they had the word grant in it. And the, these first ones come up for first, we, we grab all of them. So these are all the hashtags and mentions and websites. And we grab the first one thinking that the first one in the list is going to be really the subject. The other ones are going to be somewhat predicate to that. The screen name can be directly associated back to the survey. So you can see if you have this other information about Twitter handles and websites and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I just, when I saw this stuff, I was just compelled to say, this is structured data. <laughs> and uh, if you start with structured data, whatever you're going to put on top of it, it becomes much easier. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that's fun for me to grab onto that. So that's the, that's the tweets. I just want to show you the, cert, the clean survey data and it's very sparse and it's because I just chose the things that would be relevant. I'm not sure what a pop ID is, but they all had pop IDs. And resource ID was just for sort of the session number in, in the list of survey uh, items. This type of document is a, a steward detail. So I labeled it such. Um, and the information you have stored, you have a name and you have a website. Some of these have Twitter handles. Yeah, here's a Twitter handle, which I normalized down to this to be compared with other things. So just make it lowercase and make sure it hasn't had symbol in front. This is the org, this is the survey's website. Perhaps it matches or doesn't what we had on the Twitter. A feed and maybe the domains change or something. So anyway, um, you, you, you have a very, very static piece of information right in 2017 and you ever, everything that's happened since 2017. So this is a way to get a handle on what's happened since and fold it back into your survey information. I can go through some of the code if anyone is interested on, on how I parse this thing up in the text. So how, are you, you relating it back using the Twitter handle? Is that? Yeah. So I haven't had a chance to do this yet, but if you see that, um, Right here, we have to have this X, XTID. This would be a database identifier here. So this word name is Kitty Science. And the ID is Kitty Science 177. 177 being that resource ID, just to make it unique. I threw that on at the end of it. And this is lowercase and it's separated by a underscore and then a dash with the ID at the end. So using that ID, we can relate that back to the tweets, right? Mm -hmm. To some extent, it's not a, it's not a direct match, but we can use that and, and relate it back to the tweets and then in mentions or however that organization is referenced in the tweet, we can hopefully marry it back to the server information. Yet. Or maybe you don't have servers. Maybe there isn't server information. They weren't part of the survey. So this is brand new. That's another candidate to go uh, reach out to because they're mentioned in these uh, related tweets. Any questions? Trying to think of questions, I'll, I'll say first, just as feedback. I think this is really cool to think about um, how, how to relate the Twitter data to the survey data. Because so far, I haven't, I don't think any of us has thought about that. We've thought about them as two separate data. So this is a really great way to, to do that. And I can see the value in the, the way you've parsed the data into the, the, the structured 
data set so you can marry some things and not others. And when I see someone has a, a comment in the chat, it, it is pretty small, your windows, because I think working on a, you're working on a desktop uh, monitor. And if you could. Yeah, and I, I went to a, went to the big monitor because of reasons just now. Oh, let's see, what can we do here? Um, and really haven't done this before. If I hit control plus, what will happen? Anything good? That's what happened in a browser. No? Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll have to find that out. Yeah, so VS Code is great. I haven't been using it for very long, but I do recommend it. And <laughs> recommend figuring out how to make this be a font bit and font a larger. That seemed to bump it up. You know, you got it. You figured it out, whatever you're doing. Yeah. And the funny thing is I didn't do anything. It's one of those things. Let's just go zoom in. Is that better? And then I won't touch it. <laughs> Is that better for people? Works for me. Okay. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Eden, but it, it's actually more descriptive than JSON. And it's, uh, it, these are key words, meaning that they're not text. They, they're, they're not malleable. In fact, all of this is immutable, meaning you, you take a set and, and you transform it into something else. So there's a lot of safety in all this that, that's uh, offered as well. This is uh, as an advocate for closure and immutable functional programming. So is Eden just a kind of an S expression language out of closure? It's been a long time since I've looked at Lisp code. <laughs> yeah, what, what's, what's great about this? Thanks, Mark. So thanks, Mike. Yeah, so closure is basically everything's a data structure. Even these functions over here are data structures, right? Everything's in parentheses. And so this is a sequence where the first thing in the sequence is the, is the function. So this function is defined and this function is defined function. And then everything within here, it is an, as you say, an S expression, right? It, you, you look at this and it's standard to everything inside of closure. So the, you don't have to have your mind go somewhere else to interpret what's going on. It's as stark as it can be. Here we have rename keys. You can see what's going on, right? We, the, the first or zero element in that survey was the resource ID. And I'm just mapping that and picking the fifth one and the sixth one. It's really concise and really, I, I, it's which is my favorite language by far. <laughs> and I'll just stop there. I spent the first 10, 12 years of my, I don't want to say when, but just doing heavy duty common list packing. I mean, oh, cool. I, I did tons of it back in the old AI machines and symbolics computers. Mm -hmm. it, wow. It's complicated when you've tried to figure out data is code and code is data. But once you get it, it's pretty amazing. You're right. And then you realize everything else is not what it should be. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's definitely it, to this day, the best environment I've ever worked on was a symbolics computer. And that was in the eighties. Okay. Thanks Mike's for, and, and I'm sure we've bored everybody else here and, uh, take it back. I'll send it back to you. I had a, a couple other questions, but maybe before I ask them questions, other folks have too. I'll just give a minute. So the, the questions I was thinking about is just more broadly thinking about open data, like we've chosen to keep data and certain data structures so that it can be accessible to as many people as possible. And then what we've seen you guys doing is taking it and parsing it into other languages and structures that are more useful, right, from a coding or sorting perspective than the, the flat files and the geodatabases we have. How, how, can you, are there ways to then be able to transform and export back to uh, uh, more useful for the broader public? Yeah. So if you, if this is sparse data, right? So this right here re represents the survey and only the fields we cared about. And it's sparse so that if a field was not uh, populated, it wouldn't show up. So this is saying from that survey record, this is the only information we found that we found useful information in those fields. And, and this is simply, this could be a JSON record as well. So in, similarly, you could just have a tabular format if, if that's what you're say, suggesting. And you would have all those other fields represented and they would have just nil inside of as they would, if we just took this and put it out that way. Yeah. So, so some bottom line is, yeah. So, so, so uh, one thing about closure, I just want to pitch closure again, things are immutable. So everything you see here is a product on top of something else, right? You have a source in our case, we have the, this is the source. And if we had an API into Twitter or into the survey somewhere online. Then that would be our source and we're just pulling it. So we're not changing anything here. We're just showing you a different view of it and hopefully the identifiers for you to get back to it. So you have a res ID, you will still have the res ID. I'm not sure what a pop ID is because, but because it said pop, because it was an ID, I included over here too. So these are your um, pointers back to your full set of data. Right? Maybe one last follow-up question from me before we move on to Mike, just thinking about this now that you've 
looked at some of the guts of some of these data sets, thinking about ours, is there any recommendations on ways we can improve our data structure, but at the same time, keeping it as accessible to, to everyone as possible? Because I can see, right, you're like feeding things in and then you're parsing it. But is there anything in the, the way that the data are currently structured that you're having to manipulate to then be able to parse that maybe we should make some adjustments to? I, I think there's, I didn't want to do this. I, I didn't want to uh, relinquish the at symbol to Twitter. But basically, anytime you see a, a Twitter handle, it's going to have an at symbol in front of it. A hashtag is a hashtag. It's going to have a hashtag in front of it. A website, you're going to put HTTPS in front of this. Thing. And there's a domain, Bronx Zoo com is the domain, and then the rest of it is a path to it. So maybe separating the domain and the path, or maybe have, just having the domain as an additional attribute might be helpful. Just things like that, I think. I took a look at the survey. And it's great that you, you have it open-ended. Wait, 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 I just did a job interview uh, screen for something called um, Corgi Bytes, I think the name of the company is. And it was very refreshing that it was not like other sites that you would put things in at the end and said, okay, here's your play, here, here's your thing at the end of events on what on this form above didn't make sense or we need to know in addition to that. So on, on every form, there was this catch-all where someone could could vent how the thing, it wasn't like, did you have any problems? And it's an error thing saying, it's okay, part of this form is at the bottom, what above it isn't, isn't working for you. And that kind of survey thing, I, th I think is probably going to be, it takes more time to parse that, but that seemed to be something that's really useful information <laughs> yeah. uh, at the bottom. Yeah, great. Thanks for these thoughts, Jeff, and, and thanks for tackling some of these problems and also introducing me to Corridor. So I'll have to check that out. And uh, I really appreciate your um, effort and taking the time yeah. to play around with these things. So I don't know how you want to share things with us. We can also just chat in Discord about that too. Yeah, um, this is a, a GitHub repo called Stew Tweets, and I'll polish that up and put it out there and, uh, and then give you a link to it. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Let's give everybody a virtual round of job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And we're now we're going to shift over to, to Mike to present on some of the, the, I know you were working on a few different projects or ideas and curious to see the directions you've gone. You see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I made it about 40% of where I want to be. And, and I'm assuming you'll let me finish it and give it to you when I'm done. <laughs> let me, assuming you want it, I'll tell you what I've been doing and where I'm going to head with it. So I just put together right now, it's on my local machine. It's a, it's a Jupiter environment. So I run Jupiter lab and with what I'm going to show you. And then what I will do is I will share that out on Git and you guys can do with it, whatever you want. I do this for some work at, in open San Diego, but I've done a fair amount for hat for LA too. So this is typically the way that we share our information. But what I wanted to go through was the analysis that I was working on team four, which it says remaining questions and problems. We're trying to extend it. I think is the right word for me to use with social infrastructure for climate change. And primarily what I want to do is I want to look at external data sources that I can combine with the stew map to help do change risk. And I'm focused primarily on flood type information. And I'm trying to, I'm right now in the process of downloading the 311 data from NYC. It's a monster. I couldn't find 2021, just one year's worth. I have to get 2010 to 20 to current. So it's a big data set. But what I'm going to try to do is I'll step through right now some analysis I've done with your stew map. And, and I've looked at it. I've torn it apart. I'm focused on the turf. Once we had that discussion yesterday, the organization locations and the turfs, very similar, even though there, there's some differences in sizes and everything, but attribute space-wise, they're the same. So I'm focused on the turfs because I want to do some spatial analysis. And I'll step through what I've done with that. And then what I'm doing is I'm mapping back down here at NYC data. I've looked at some NOAA floodplain data too. I'm trying to get the polygons so that I can start to merge data sets and do combinations here that are both attribute level and spatial join level. And then possibly the way that you talk about it is they typically do... It's the word that you use response to disturbances. So data sets that are specific to a weather event or something like that. Maybe we can go back in time and kind of look at some of that. The idea being, can we marry the people that work those problems with the people that work your stewards? I think that's where we're headed, right? Is that where you guys want to go before? I... Yeah. I'm not sure if you can see us. So 
chiming in over audio. Oh, no, I'm not watching that. Okay. So what I'm going to step through right now is some of the pieces that I have. I've organized it thusly that I have a, some way I can explore the stew map that you have. I've started looking at the NYC data that I have. I'll step through some of that. I haven't gotten to my data fusion aspects or the specific questions I want to do, but I typically, uh, I'll, this is straightforward. Once I get the data built out of the NYC and I have the explore, and then I start to do spatial joins and attribute joins and things like that to build an intermediate data set that I can do uh, processing on. So to answer your earlier question with regards to different data formats, I think in the end of the day, I'm taking in a geodata file of some geodata file of some sort. It could be shape, it could be geojson, it could be whatever it is. And I build an intermediate representation, which is typically a data frame centric approach. And then I can apply tools to it. I can filter it. I can pivot. I can subset. I can do all that. And then I can generate products out the other end here. And so what you have to do is you have to serialize all these results back in a form people could consume, which for the most part in what I'm talking about will be a shape. I can easily generate GeoJSON and my kind of my new preferred format is something called Parquet just because it's so much faster and more efficient on my poor computer. But yeah, at the end of the day, data comes in primarily in your formats, could be CSVs, it could be shapes, geodatabases, whatever it is transformed into an intermediate format that, that my tools can work on and then extracted out in products into a format you can, people can use. Does that make sense? That, that's really the objective in all this stuff. Yeah. Thank you. This is really clear. Thanks, Mike. Okay. So then what I'm going to just go ahead now and step through is the way that I, I'm just laying it out in my common workflow. This is the way when I encounter a new data set or a new collection of data sets, I just break it up. This is the way my brain works. I'm an old engineer, so I just start breaking stuff apart. The steps that I'm going to typically go through is just get it in there. And so if I have a geodatabase, I have to deal with the layers and all that kind of jazz. And, you know, I'm, shape files are a little bit different. Geodatabases are one thing. So you just, there's different kinds of ways you look at the actual raw data that's coming in. I always want to check out coordinate reference systems. I don't know if I'm going, if you guys are familiar with CRSs or projection schemes and all that, because if you want to do spatial analysis of any sort, you got to, you have to standardize on the type of co coordinate reference system you're using so that if I compute an area or I compute a distance or I compute intersections, then it, we're talking about the same kind of scalar level of things. It's a standard way that I can do it. This is, you guys want to hear about geodata frames? No, I'm just going to go through this. I put it into one of my data frame things, this geopandas that I'm using for this. I can look at the projections in the CRSs that come out of it. I can show you right here. This is the way that there's standard places you can go look for a description of what these different projections are. The only thing really to, to note here, I was just doing some stuff out here in LA and I'm using a different projection because it's made for a different part of the world. Because what you're trying to do is you have notion of units, excuse me. So if I want to do square miles, I have to do some math to turn meters into miles. And I, in LA area out here, I was using the, the planar system for state of California. And so they do it in feet. So square miles is a little bit easier to compute out of it. You can get this, this is math. You can do the divides and, you know, all multiplies and all that kind of crap to get there. But this is just a more efficient way to do it. I always like to look at and just see what format the data is in when I get it. So I'm getting, this is your stew map type data, the turfs, and that's its projection. I have no idea why it is what it is, but it is something more akin to your North region, wh wherever your lab is, it's, it's centered. So once I do that, what I want to do is I want to look at all of the attribute information you have. This is the discussion we had yesterday. And by the way, that that reference to look off at the um, actual survey was very helpful to figure out what these things mean. It was clearly the right way to go about this, Lindsay, just to make, made it a lot easier on me. But what I was really trying to look at is what's inside of this thing. So I could look at the attribute type information. It, it, so that's really, I read the data. I understand coordinates. You can see it over here, the reference system. I look at the data. And so I could just start to query on it and make sense of it and see null values. And you guys have lots of strings in here that don't have, you know, just on and on. And then what I want to do is I want to very quickly look at it. So I want to visualize it. A couple of ways I can do that with a GeoPandas data frame is just a basic 
plot. So it's just putting it on, you, you notice here that I have to change the coordinate reference system to be lat long here so that these axes make sense. Yeah, I can look at it that way. The other way I commonly look at it is in a folium type of display. Folium is a wrapper on top of leaflet JS, which is a very commonly used uh, JavaScript library for mapping type things. So now I can just start to look at stuff and kind of see it understand a little bit about the complexity of this data and how everything overlaps. And it's crazy. Your data set is a little bit strange to me. So then what I start to do is I start to step down inside of the attributes. I, Cause what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to take your 800 plus records that have some amount of complexity that, that go all over the state, they go into Pennsylvania, they go to New Jersey, Maine, they're all over the place. I want to find the set of, and, and I read in your documentation that the polygon related to the, or the organization is where they operate. So what I'm trying to do is find the polygons that are in and around New York city so that I can start to do spatial relationships on those polygons. So I can just do basic things. I can look at, if I look at the primary uh, service type, is that service type? Yeah, whatever. The, the, type. The, is that right? Service type? Site type. Site type. I was close. So the private, the most common one is community garden. Okay. If I look at another one, what's my primary focus? The most common one is environment. So I just can start to, you know, wind my way through that. I do see a fair amount, like in this data set, 73 of them, there's no text string here. It turns out they're just, it's a blank string. So it's still there. Makes your data a lot bigger, but I'm not sure why it's there, but it's funny. Um, they, but they are still missing to me. The other way I might want to look at it is by state. It seems like a lot of them fall in, in New York. That's good. Zip codes would be potentially another way for me to start to subset it. Remember, I'm trying to take your data set and turn it into something smaller that my brain can wrap around. So this might be another way to do it. I can also look at just by the city. Okay. So New York just pops out right away. New York here. There's another New York here, all caps. There's a Brooklyn here. That's right case. There's a Brooklyn here. That's all caps. There's a Brooklyn here. That's all lowercase. So it's just all that standard kind of stuff that you would want to clean up and normalize, I think on this type of data. The other thing that I can then start to do is I can start to look at subsets of this. I want to look at the ones that are, whose primary focus is environment. And then I want to look at the counts of the, the um, side types that they have. So you would see that makes sense. You know, that if your primary focus is environment, then your primary site type is going to be a community garden. I guess all those things make sense. So then this is another way of looking at the subset of data because what I did is I just built a data frame now that can take these specific ones that are a primary focus of environment and I can just look at those. So you see, I'm starting to build something that I can winnow in on and stuff can go away and I'm cleaning things up. And I do the same thing for cities. So I started my mental map of New York is pretty weak because I don't really know where stuff is. I'm not even sure where Staten Island is, to be honest with you. Is that where that? I, none of us are actually it's the fifth borough <laughs> it's very very close to new jersey it's a good zone yeah this gray thing here yeah yep, yep. that one <laughs> my mental map is so bad but i just i don't know why this thing appears up here but that once again it's just data it's the way it works so anyway i could start to wind through this but the point i wanted to try to make here was that what my goal is to come up with ways to query this data and to filter it and to aggregate it and to subset it so that I could build separate representations. So we're in the iterative phase in here. Now I'm looking at other kinds of things to try to make data sets get smaller and smaller so that I can start to combine it with others. Okay. So that's what I've done with your stew data. You follow that? Does it make sense? Do you have any questions before we go on to the other? No, this is great. It all makes sense to me. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Okay. So then the other part that I've started to look at is the <clears throat> stuff I can from open data NYC somewhere. So that's really my objective that I'm going through here. The first thing that I found was really this planning department that I saw yesterday, because what I'm trying to do is get the polygons or other information content around water related focuses and site types that are related to the, to water type problems. And so I can, so you can start to filter through this. I just do a common little thing to keep it all in one place. I just throw it in an iframe inside of Jupiter. So I have it here. Some places will allow embedded iframes so that they don't break other kind of sites don't. But in this case, it's easy. I could see what these different kind of keys are on the shape file that I can download. Here's the various shapes. This because it's cloud issue. 
And then it's really easy and straightforward for me to start to come through and read these, look at them, visualize them, see what's inside of these, that kind of thing. So I can still start to get some sense for what's going on with this data, this new data set. And then once I get the joint, I'll be able to take that, the polygon information from your stew map, compute an intersection and see what makes sense here. And then when I get to the point where I can do 311 data, it's been running for a half an hour from the download from Open NYC. I'm at 14 and a half gigabytes and it's still running. God, that's crazy. 28 million rows it has in it. That was an aside. So anyway, I, I can do this kind of thing. I can start, this is one big feature here. This guy is, um, this guy is the waterfront one. Maritime activity zone, I think it was. But yeah, I can just step through all these shape files. I can find the stuff that I need. I can start to filter on that. And then I can use that when I want to start to join it with your data. That's my objective here. And just stepping through these. So I think at that, I might stop because that's where I am. The next step would be to do the data fusion part of it, which to me is just going to be, I normalize on those coordinate reference systems and I start combining stuff. And I will probably just do intersection type things when I have polygons. So I find ones that are in both of these multiple um, in polygons. I'm containing one that's probably stew. And then I will subset it with the ones that are also in um, pick a data set here. And I'll step through it and try to find some relationships. And then what I'll do when I get to the 311 data is going to be point data. So I looked at the spec. I'll probably have to, it's a CSV file, so I'll have to turn the text versions of the uh, location geometries into well-known text geometry so I can get it in here to do the spatial processing. But I, once I get this thing down, oh, it's done. <laughs> if I was brave, I'd try to do something with it, but I know it's so big, I'm going to have to split it up when I'm going to have to do stuff, but I might be able to get it done tonight. <laughs> you never know. So anyway, what I'm going to do with the 311 data is I am going to just look at 2021 or maybe even, maybe I'll even pick the last six months of 2021 or the first three months of 2022, depending on what they have in there. And then I, what I was thinking about was if you guys could shoot me at a time when you had a storm, some sort of a major storm kind of an issue that maybe that would be the, the time frame I would look at. Because what I'm going to try to do is find the 311 request types that are one of these request basin or catch basin related complaints and see if I can see any kind of pattern for that time frame in these areas. I'm going to have your areas, stew map areas. I'm going to have flood zone areas from wherever they are. I'm going to have 311 data for those same ones to see if I can start to answer some of your basic questions about flood risk in 311 data. That's great, Mike. Um, That's where I am. So there's just a, a couple of uh, comments that have been happening in the chat as you're talking. You might want to take, we've identified a couple of storms to check out and some other things are dropped in the comments too. But this is fantastic. Again, I, I think, yeah, you could look at the site type or there's a few other things in the survey to, to parse the, the groups by as you're starting to add things together, or you could take groups as a whole as well. Um, so somebody talked about neighborhood tabulation areas. You mean, is that a census thing or is that in an NYC? That's a census thing. So it allows you to group in across neighborhood. And I thought some of the uh, way groups self-identified Long Island City versus Queens. So it can get messy if you go by city name. So those neighborhood tabulation areas are census defined things and the city has mapped those. So there's got to be something you can download. Okay. I, I used to work with the community gardens um, in the Bronx. I just retired. So I'm having fun on open data week. Okay. Okay. That's cool. I'll look at this, you know, okay. 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 So this should be, I can just visualize the polygons that Stu map has and some of these, yeah, there's probably going to be some reasonable overlaps here. Cool. There's also a very interesting data set trying to capture like the personal experiences in flooding called flood watch. If you might be interested, I think taking a look at it to some uh, other than the official data. Cool. These are all good pointers. I'll, I'll, I will add them to my list. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments or thoughts or? I'll just say, I like the direction everything's going and I can see your path. It's very clear. Um, excited to see like where you go and thanks for, it sounds like you're able to spend a little more time on that. And we appreciate that. Yeah, give me a week or so. 
<laughs> I'm like, guys in LA are bugging me for stuff. And I've been, did you guys have a student? I, you said you have one in LA. Do you have one in Oakland? No, we don't. No, I just put the link to the LA report and we can connect you with the folks that have the data. It's, I don't think the new, the clean data set's not posted on the website yet. Is it Michelle? I don't think so, but I know they need an interactive map. Yeah. If you need an interactive map, then you can probably stream the the data from the interactive map. But Michelle Romolini, I'm sure, would be happy to share data for someone to explore it and work with it. it it's not quite as big as the New York City set, but um, it's a little more recent. And yeah, I, I, they're interested in a lot of the same issues, maybe more drought than flooding. But once you've worked through the logics, you could apply the same approach over there. Okay. Yes, 311 is. It's big. <laughs> Okay, that's what I've done. Questions or comments for Mike? I, I just put one in on 311 data. Stormwater is one of my fun things to do. It's been really spotty with people not knowing to use 311 to report. The neighborhood that I live in is where the Deegan flooded and cars were floating, and there were very few flood reports put into 311. <clears throat> Like I was so saying, that today. equity, that equity of a three one one service issue it is a layer to keep it mind. Yeah, I I've worked a fair amount with the um, LA three one one data. It's not nearly. I, I guess we don't in, in Southern California. We don't have a lot of the same problems you guys have, like heat in my building and drains backing up and kind of stuff. So your three one one data um, request types are much much richer than what I've seen in on the West Coast for sure. Okay, I'll look at all those. I imagine you get the, the brush fire reports. But they're never 311. I think the biggest thing as an aside here, environmentally, per, that I've noticed in the last year is the smoke in the air when we have the fires. You have a fire up in the Sierras. It's many hundreds of miles away, but the way the wind blows, and those fires have been burning like crazy, and the air, the, the brown air just comes straight south and you, there's sensors, purple air and FEMA has some sensors and you just watch your air quality. It's insane. Can't go outside. That's the one thing I've noticed. So. You know, we had last year, I think it was at one point we had air, air quality. It was so bad. The fires out West that it turned our air very dark and, and the, the sun was orange midday here as well. Yeah. But, yeah. Thanks, Jetstream. Yep, that's what happens, huh? Okay. I don't know, Mike, and we've asked questions of you, but do you have any questions for us as well at this point? Or Not yet for me. Maybe there'll come a point where um, a little more feedback on what, what, what kind of time your zones to look at and if there's any utility in this. And then potentially if, there, if there's some analytic techniques, I want to try to apply some different kind of Python analytic techniques or tools and packages that allow me to do some cross filtering so I can pick from one representation. Maybe I have a histogram of some sort of a thing and I highlight the ones that are in certain values and then I see them on maps. It's kind of a, and maybe you guys are familiar with the notion of cross filtering or linked brushes on your the analysis that you do, but there's some pretty interesting work that's been going on with some, some of the tools in the Python widget environment that allow you to do cross filtering. So this looks like a data set that I can do some of that with when I get there. But yeah, I, I'll, I'd be more than willing to potentially in a week or so set up another one of your office. You guys want to do an office hour at some point with some more? We can definitely do that. You want to reach out over Discord and we can mm -hmm. find it. Online. Are you guys mostly Discord? Not usually. I can also do it over email, but I think it, it might just lend itself to the conversation in Discord. To yeah, we I've used Discord a fair amount, so. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. I'll, okay, got it. Yeah, great. And Jeff, I, I don't know how you feel too, but as people are on things and, and want to chat uh, with us, happy to do that. Also, I, I realize we set this hackathon to have an end time and we don't expect anyone to, to continue beyond it unless they're, they themselves are like, yay, I, I want to keep working with these data. So I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm, I'm definitely starting to get the local focus on everything. I live in Harlem, uh, central Harlem, down bluff, meaning that rock face that goes all the way from Morningside up into Inwood. And when you were talking about the storm drain clearing and getting people responsible for that in the community, that was pretty intriguing. Like getting people more, if you're feeling a part of the environment around them, that's the kind of level that, that I'm interested in. And that, and that the trees, they walk by these trees that there's a tree that looks like it's blooming in August, but it's not. It's just these gummy seeds that are forming on it. 
And I'm still trying to find out exactly what kind of tree that is. So I'll be looking into the, your, your data resources for that. By that, do you mean looking at the New York City Street Tree map or how are yeah, yeah, yeah. There's particular trees. You walk by them every day yeah. and it's like, like last summer, I was totally perplexed as to exactly what kind of tree that is. It's a large, maybe a, what they call it, a gu- it's not gummy. It, it's, it has to do with, with the kind of pods they make. It's, Sweet uh, gum. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, if people were walking by a tree and, and could identify that tree a little better, that that would probably make them feel better about what they're doing and participate. Yeah, the New York City Parks did a fair bit of that with the tree census back in 2015, 2016. And we're starting to get close to, in a few years, they're going to do that again in 2025. And they are always working with involving in the public in, in mapping. And so you, you go and do a little training and then there's that they have. It's all behind the scenes. Pretty cool. They have block face geospatial data, so they can say, here, the exact distance from one curve to the other end of the curve. And they d- use some surveying techniques that, that basically you measure a wheel, or like a survey wheel out a certain distance. And by the time you finish it, they turn it into points. And they're like, here's where the trees are along that line. It's, it's really cool. So Jeff, you might be, take a look in a couple of years. You might see some signs for trees count. And if you do, you should definitely sign up. I think you might enjoy it. Do, do you know if, uh, if you, uh, Tag, I guess they're called invasive. They're called, it's a worse word than invasives, but there are certain trees that have, have that are proliferated in the city and they actually are harmful to the other trees around them. And they look similar to the, so they look similar to the ones that aren't harmful. Is there any sort of information like that that's being, um, collected now? I guess it depends on some things. And in, in, I see Jody put a link to New York City Park stewardship program. So there's definitely ways to get involved even before the tree census. And you could talk with that group about specifically to your locale, like some ways you might be interested in stewarding public spaces, right? Like we can't do any work on private spaces, but Jody, if you wanna jump in. Oh yeah, sorry, my camera's off. I'm walking around doing house chores. So you can become a care captain where they give you a hands-on or a webinar training and adopt a set of street trees. And I think Michelle put a link in to the map where you can actually report your activity. So there's a record of the care for specific trees. It's very cool. And then you can learn how to deal with the invasives. I would like, there's not a worse word than invasive. So they have a lot of different training programs and a lot of that, that are individuals. They're not really the organizations that we're filling out Stu Map. And, and again, I'm like, yeah, please update it. Now I'm retired. My group was inactive for 10 years. We're back. You know? <laughs> so. That's great. Thanks, Jody. But also, Jeff, you could use Map to look at your neighborhood on the interactive map or parse the data how you like um, to see if there are groups that, that work on trees in your neighborhood and you'd have the contact information to reach out to them. Hopefully it's up to date. I see where like basically until time, we just set this to be an hour. So unless there's any other conversation threads we, we need to have, I'd, I'd say we're ready to wrap up and we can shift the, the conversation to Discord. I dropped the link way, way back to folks that are, haven't participated in the hackathon. You're welcome to join the, the Discord. What do you, I can't remember what you call it, the, whole, the, the, the hackathon Discord and follow some of the conversations and see where Mike and Jeff's were leads over time. So also I want to say thank you to to Mike and to Jeff for really spending a lot of your your time really thinking about our data, playing with it, and just advancing our conversation. We very much appreciate the time that you've given and looking forward to future conversations. Thanks. All right, everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend and hopefully it'll be nicer weather outside tomorrow, at least for those of us in New York, Mike. <laughs> it's probably always lovely there. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be around 70. Okay. You're right. nice. That's that's nice by the ocean. So yeah. that's good. All right. Take care, everyone. All right. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.